So before we get started, let me just remind you about something from last week. Last week I talked about how to be used by God and I said that children's ministry could really use teachers and assistants and check-in people. And so I just wanna re-urge that call. We could really use that because we want that to be a place where it's, it's not daycare, it's not childcare. It is we are teaching our kids about Jesus. And so we wanna make sure that we do the best job we can and we need your help. So if you're willing, you can fill out a Connect card. You can stop by the Connect booth. Just tell somebody, hey, I'm willing to do that. We would love to get you involved. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, so a man goes to the doctor. He's not been feeling well for a couple of months and he knows something's not right. So he goes to the doctor. The doctor runs a bunch of tests, does a physical examination and comes back and says, man, I am... I'm sorry to tell you, you're going to die. It's a terrible disease and you've got six months to live. And, and the patient, as you can imagine, was, was devastated by this. And he, uh, was, he was in disbelief. And so he goes for a second opinion to a different doctor. And the doctor runs all those same tests and does the same examination. And then he comes in and he says, hey, here's what I need you to do. I need you to move to Louisiana, marry the meanest woman you can find, and start a pig farm. And the guy's like, how's that going to extend my life? And he said, the doctor said, it won't, but it'll make six months feel like forever. <laughs> A lot of you guys know my wife. She is pretty amazing. If you don't know what she does around here, she makes this place go. It is all behind the scenes. It is all, but it takes care of all the financial stuff, uh, all of the, I mean, operations, all of the setup, everything from communion. She does a million things, but more important than that, she's put up with me for 35 years. That deserves some applause, I think. She's taught with me a couple of times over the last several years, and when she does, she definitely classes up the discussion, I'll say that. We're in our sermon series, Dangerous Prayers, and today we're talking about the dangerous prayer heal me. And as you, a lot of you know, my wife has suffered with lupus for about 16 years now. And so she has a little different perspective on this prayer, heal me, than I do. And so I'm excited to have her teach with me today. And, and this prayer for heal me is different than some other dangerous prayers. Because like last week, we talked about the prayer, use me. And if you pray, use me, God, and, and you're sincere about that, and you listen to his call, you could wind up in some places where you didn't think you would be. You can be a little uncomfortable with what you're called to. Maybe you get called to be a missionary to some place across the world, or you get called to children's ministry, or to work with our prison, you know, with prison ministry or, or homeless ministry and all these different areas that maybe you didn't think would, you would be working in. And if you are sincere about this, that, you're almost certainly going to be called to something that scares you or at least makes you a little uncomfortable when you're called. And I can tell you that Lil getting up on stage is outside her comfort zone. It is a calling because she knows this is an important topic. She gets pretty nervous. And there was one night this week where she didn't sleep one single minute worrying about this. She prefers to stay in the background and doing all of the necessary things that nobody really sees. But the prayer, heal me, it feels a little different. Well, I can tell you having your husband trip over the cords for the TV... <laughs> Not helping nerves whatsoever. <laughs> I think it should calm you down. That, I mean, that's the worst that can happen up here. Oh, uh, okay. Um, so heal me is actually a really routine prayer. When faced with illness, injury, or profound suffering, the impulse to cry out to a higher power for healing is nearly a universal human response. Even if you don't profess a belief in God, people find themselves instinctively crying out for healing in their darkest moments of need. Heal me is probably the most routine and common prayer there is. Yeah, it's definitely the most common prayer request I get as a pastor uh, or that we get as a church. We'll have new guests that will fill out the Connect card and they'll put, you know, some prayer for healing for either themselves or a family member or a close friend. It can be healing from physical disease or injury. It can be prayers for healing from mental illness or depression or addiction or the hurt from past abuse or trauma. I know a lot of people who are suffering with pain or you know someone, someone close to you who is, and if you don't, you probably will at some point in the future. So it's important that we spend some time talking about prayers for healing. But how is the prayer, heal me, a dangerous prayer? And I don't think it is unless you're willing to do it right. 
Yeah, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Mark chapter 2 in the New Testament. I preached out of Mark chapter 1 last week, and so I gave some background on what I think is a very interesting and unique book of the Bible. And if you missed last week's sermon, I would encourage you to go back and watch that on either YouTube or Facebook. You can also go to our new podcast and check it out there. It's called A Closer Look, and we put our weekly sermons there, but we also put uh, a discussion where some of our pastors go deeper into the sermon topic from the week before, and we do a video podcast. You can either watch it or listen to it. If you want to download that podcast, I would you go and search for A Closer Look, Kara City, and you can do that on any of the major podcast apps. Well, today we're looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, where Jesus is going to heal a man who's been paralyzed. And let's start with verses 1 and 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So Jesus is teaching in a house and people hear that he's come back to town and so they are coming to see him. And I think this probably started as a pretty small event with just some people sitting inside the house. But as people here start to spread the word that Jesus is in town, more and more people come to see him. And so the house fills up, then people are outside the doors and the windows trying to catch a glimpse or a, a word from Jesus. And it gets so crowded that people are so far away from the door that they can't even really hear what Jesus is saying. Uh, they just want to be near this, this amazing teacher who can heal with just a word from his mouth or a touch from his hand. All right, look at verses three through four. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. So imagine what happens here. These four good buddies, obviously these are good friends because they carry this guy on a mat. They get there hoping to see this teacher that can heal, hoping they can, uh, that he'll heal their friend. But they get there and I'm sure they were disappointed because not only can they not get in the house, they can't even get near the house. And so they come up with, I think, what's kind of a desperate plan here. They go up on the roof, carry him up to the roof. They dig a hole in the roof. Now, here's why that works that way, because back then roofs were uh, made typically of wooden beams, and then they would lay thatch or brush across those beams. Then they'd put sod or, or dirt on top of that to protect from the rain. And usually houses were just one room structures. So they get up there, they start digging in what was obviously a pretty big hole in somebody else's roof to, to get down to Jesus. Like, can you imagine being in the room listening to Jesus teach? Like this, I'm sure they were, they were captivated. They're hearing the, the son of God teaching directly to them. And then all of a sudden you hear, you know, a digging noise in the roof. And you're like, well, I wonder what that is. And then dirt starts to fall a little bit and you can see the, the roof kind of shake. And then you see light coming through the roof and you see a hole start to form that gets big enough for someone to be lowered down. And then you see some dude coming down lowered from the roof. That's a pretty big distract, distraction. Like if Pastor Chris comes down out of the roof on a trapeze, I'm done. Sermon <laughs> over, I'm going home. I'm going to get some therapy set up and move on with my life, right? That's a big distraction. And I think Chris coming down on a trapeze is not an image any of us wants to leave with today. But this paralyzed man coming down from the roof had to be a big distraction for the people that were there and for Jesus. But but Jesus isn't phased at all. And in fact, some of my very favorite stories about Jesus are when he was interrupted, either by someone asking a question or uh, interrupting him for some you know, task or healing. I just think that's when he is at his very best. All right, look at verses five through 12. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, take up your mat and go home. The man got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. So these guys bring their buddy to Jesus for physical healing, right? They wanted Jesus to do something for this man, to heal him of his paralysis. 
But it's clear Jesus was more interested in doing something in him to forgive his sins. But there are some religious leaders in the house and, you know, they're already thinking, you know, who is this guy to forgive someone of their sins? And they accuse Jesus of the sin of blasphemy. Well, blasphemy is really insulting God. And the insult to God here that they thought was happening was that Jesus was claiming the right to forgive sin, which only God had the power and authority to do. But obviously, Jesus being God had that authority. And so Jesus can read their mind, which is pretty cool if you can do that. He, he knows what they're thinking. And so he said, look, what's easier to tell this paralyzed man to get up and walk or to tell him that his sins are forgiven? So he says, get up, go home. And the dude gets up and he takes his mat and he leaves. This man's prayer for healing was answered. Yes, this passage of scripture has some powerful truths for us as we take a pretty routine prayer, heal me. And we make it a dangerous prayer that can transform who we are and will bring healing, but maybe not in the way we're expecting. There are three keys to making the prayer, heal me, a dangerous prayer. And here's the first one. You need to pray in, in desperation. The men who brought their friend to Jesus to be healed were desperate. If they weren't desperate, they'd have just waited outside the house until Jesus was finished preaching and the crowd went away. That's not what they do. They climb up on top of somebody else's house, dig a hole in their roof, and then lower their friend down and interrupt Jesus. That's a pretty desperate move, but that desperation gets Jesus' attention. And here's the truth of this. God is drawn to desperation. Time after time in the Bible, God shows off his greatest power when his people are their most desperate. He parts the Red Sea when the nation of Israel is about to be slaughtered. He sends an angel into the fiery furnace to protect Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen to how King David says this in Psalm 34, 17 to 18. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God is drawn to desperation. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You can tell stories of how you were the closest to God when you were suffering and desperate. Desperate prayer often reveals one of the most vulnerable aspects of human nature, and that's our own limitations. In recognizing our own weaknesses and inability to help ourselves, we most experience God's strength. The reality is this. There can be no healing without hurt. There can be no miracle without misery, no power without pain, no blessing without brokenness, and no deliverance without desperation. Almost all of us have experienced some type of pain. Even though we may try, we can't always prevent pain in our bodies, whether it's from an illness, an injury, or just getting older. Unavoidable pain can even show up in our minds through anxiety, depression, and other mental health struggles. Our spirit can unexpectedly feel pain through broken relationships, heart, heartbreak, setbacks, or loss of a loved one. Of all the things that I struggle with in lupus, pain is the most defeating. Most days it's manageable, but at its worst, it creates every step, every action, a pain that is joy-stealing, complaint-inducing, and absolutely exhausting. And on those especially bad days, I have two choices. I can give up and give in to the pain, or I can be desperate for God because I know I can't do it on my own. My prayers on those days, they're different. They aren't just casual requests like, hey, give me a good day, or, you know, let me be productive today, let me get something done. They're, they're God, I need you. I cannot do this without you. They are, help me. Give me strength, walk with me through this. And frankly, without that desperation, that absolute need for God, I don't usually call out to him in that way. It's a powerful reminder to me of how our deepest connections to God often come not from our moments of strength, but from our moments of greatest weakness. In the Old Testament, King David describes the desperation we should have for God. He says this in Psalm 42, 1, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Picture a deer that's run across a field and it's thirsty and it's desperate for a drink of water and it's panting as it, as it reaches that stream. That's how we should be, always desperate for God's presence in our lives. 
Yeah, a lot of you guys know the, the, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's in Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus is teaching us on how to pray. And he's not telling us the words to say, but he is giving us a model for how we should pray. And, and Jesus says this in verses 9 through 13. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then listen, listen to this next part, verse 11. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Think about verse 11 in that model prayer. He says, give us today our daily bread. That's a prayer of desperation. He's not saying give us enough food to last for six weeks or two months. Don't give us enough food to fill a refrigerator, a pantry, and two freezers, which a lot of us have. It's saying this prayer is, I'm desperate. I need food for today. And then tomorrow, I'm going to pray that same desperate prayer for more food for that day. And, and here's the problem for us as Americans. Most of us have enough food to last for weeks, even if we couldn't go to the store. We, we have food around us. We have a grocery store right down the street. And so we don't have this daily desperate need for even just the basic necessities like food, like people in other parts of the world have today and people in the past have had. And, and it keeps us from being desperate for God. And so we forget how we need God. But, but see, when we cry out in desperation for God to heal us, man, that is the need that God is looking for. That's the desperation that he wants us to have for him. You know, desperation to us sounds like something bad, but I will say this, desperation is a gift. Desperation is a gift because it reminds us of why we need God. And so when we say this prayer, heal me in desperation, it goes from being a routine prayer to being a desperate prayer and a dangerous prayer. Yeah, the second key to make the prayer, heal me, a dangerous prayer, is to pray in faith. Look back at verses four through five. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and they lowered the mat the, mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Verse five says that when Jesus saw their faith, he responded. When these guys loaded their friend up on a mat and went to find Jesus, they didn't even know if they could get to him. When the man was lowered down into the room, he didn't know if Jesus would heal him, but he knew that Jesus could heal him. When we pray for healing, we have to have faith in God that he can heal us. We need to believe in his power, but we don't know if he will choose to heal in the way we're hoping. And that, I think, is the more difficult part of faith. It comes in trusting, hoping that God will do what we want, but not knowing that that is what's going to happen. When it comes to this issue of healing, we also have to have faith in God's plan for us. Job 13, 15 says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Like Job, we find ourselves in circumstances that test the limits of our endurance. And like Job, we have to know that deep unwavering faith isn't about getting what we pray for. It's about trusting God's character and purpose even in our darkest moments. Though he slay me, I will trust him. Faith is an absolute trust in God, even in the face of death. We need to believe that his plan and his will for our life is better than ours. True faith is trusting God even when he doesn't heal the way we hope and pray, or even when the answer is no. Yeah, the Apostle Paul, we would all agree, is, was a man of great faith. But we know that Paul struggled. He had some physical disability or some physical sickness that he carried with him through most of his life and that causes him to suffer and that, that God decided not to heal. Listen to what Paul says about this to the church in Corinth. This is 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. He's talking about this physical disability. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Like, here's what's so interesting about this passage of Scripture. 
We know that Paul could heal people through the power of Jesus Christ. We know he did it a lot in, the, in Acts, and we see that through his writing about the healings. And Paul actually brings someone back from the dead on one occasion. We read about that in Acts chapter 20. Here's what's going down in that moment is Paul's been preaching for a while, and some dude is listening, and he gets kind of bored, and he starts leaning back, and he falls out a window on an upper floor, hits the ground, and dies. Paul runs down and lays across him, and, and cries out to God, and the man comes back to life. But so, I mean, that's a big deal. We know that Paul has some pretty powerful healing skills. We also know that he's a better Christian than I am, because if you get bored and go to sleep in my sermon, I got no sympathy for you. I'm just going to be real clear. <laughs> but Paul can miraculously heal other people, but he can't heal himself. And the question is, why is that? It's because God did not choose to heal Paul in that moment the way he wanted. But Paul accepts God's will. He understands that God knows what's best for him ultimately. And he has complete trust and faith in God, even though God doesn't take away his suffering. And that's what faith is. Faith is this absolute trust in God's will for our lives, even when we don't really understand what he's up to. So here's the worst case scenario for us when we are physically sick. We never get physical healing the way we want, and ultimately, it results in our death, right? That's the, the worst possible case for that situation. But is it as bad as we think it is? What does, what does the Bible tell us about this place called heaven? For followers of Jesus, heaven is a place where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no tears, there is no sadness, there is no death, and so we get to be in the actual physical presence of God. The Apostle Paul talks about his expectation for death and going to heaven in Philippians 1, 20 through 23. Look at that. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. In other words, I'll do stuff for Jesus and to die is gain or better. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So Paul has such an incredible faith in God that he knows, man, it's only going to get better when I pass on through this life and go to heaven. And if we have faith in heaven, then the lack of physical healing becomes a little less scary for us. See, death scares us, and I get it, does me, because this life is all we know. We can see it, we can touch it. But when we understand heaven, it, it should make us feel a little different about that. But here's what God knows. And I want to be very clear about how this looks in, in this physical healing category. God knows what eternity looks like for us. He sees the other side. And, and so I think he's probably a little less concerned about physical healing for us than we are. So when we pray this dangerous prayer for healing, we need to pray with complete trust in God's power, but also complete faith in his judgment and his plan. Yeah, the third and last key for turning a prayer for healing into a dangerous prayer is probably the most difficult for us, or it is for me. When we pray, heal me, and we do it in desperation and faith, we also have to pray in submission, submission to God's plan and God's will. Like the paralyzed man, our desire is usually for physical healing from whatever it is we're suffering from. But God may have a different type of healing in mind. It's about surrendering not just our bodies, but our very understanding of what healing should look like. We have to acknowledge God's sovereignty and that he knows best, even when it's different from what we think is best. Yeah, look back at, at Mark 2, verses 5 through 11. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So, so he said to the man, get up, take your mat and go home. This man did not come here for spiritual healing. He didn't say to his buddies, hey, take me to Jesus so he can forgive me of my sins. He said, no, no, take me to Jesus so that I can walk again. But that's not what Jesus does first. He heals him spiritually by forgiving his sins. That was more important to Jesus because he was preparing this man for eternity. 
Look, I, I don't even know if Jesus would have healed him physically if the, the Pharisees or whoever the religious leaders were that were there hadn't have been there and been thinking, this dude can't forgive sins. I, I'm not sure if he would have healed him physically. I hope so. I think so, but I don't know that. But what we know is that Jesus was way more concerned about this man's eternity than he was this temporary life and him walking again. See, if we pray this prayer to God, heal me, and we do it with desperation and with faith and in submission to him, we will be healed. I can guarantee you that. Now, it it may not be the physical healing that we want or in the way we want because healing can take several different forms. Healing can, first of all, be true physical healing with no medicine, no doctor treatment, just a miracle of God. And I've seen that happen. I've seen cancer go away. Somebody goes back to start their treatment and the cancer's just gone. I, I remember praying for a lady one time that had pancreatic cancer. And if you know anything about pancreatic cancer, you know that's pretty much a death sentence. But we prayed for her and I ran into her several years later and she was fine and walking and she thanked me for praying for her. And she said, you know, my pancreatic cancer, it just went away. Doctors didn't even know why. There was no miracle drug. There was just a miracle. God does that. God might also choose to use doctors and medicine to heal. Now, that may be a painless treatment that goes away instantly, but it also may be months of chemotherapy and radiation, and it's a long process. But that, too, is a miracle. If you've ever ever had appendicitis and had your appendix removed, you just experienced a miracle because 200 years ago, that probably would have been a death sentence. Things that we treat routinely now, like infections, we couldn't deal with those at one point in time. God gave us the intelligence and the ability to to make medicines and treatments and healings, and those things are gifts from God. So God may use modern medicine to bring about physical healing that you want, but God may not heal you physically at all. Even with desperate prayer and great faith, you may never recover from the cancer or the heart disease or the other illness and it may ultimately be the cause of your physical death. But that doesn't mean you're not healed. Remember in our passage, Jesus wanted to heal this man spiritually and prepare him for eternity. And that was more important than healing him physically. If we have a really good run in this life, we'll live, what, maybe 95 years? I think we'd all agree that's a, that's a really long life. But compare that to a million years or a billion years. It's just a fraction of that amount of time. And God is more focused on getting us ready for eternity than he is for making us comfortable in this life. When we pray for healing, we're usually praying that God would do something for us. Heal us in a physical way, but God is more interested in doing something in us than for us. And he may also want to do something through us. In the beginning of my illness, I prayed for healing from lupus. I wanted physical healing. I wanted Jesus to do something for me. But soon I realized that Jesus was doing something in me and in my family. Through this disease, we were being healed. Good was happening. The biggest thing in our family is that we came back to God and back to church. We had been less than committed for a very long time. Our marriage was okay, but it wasn't great. Nathan's priority was his career, and family and God were somewhere off in the distance. I was disappointed, which eventually grew into bitterness and resentment. But after my diagnosis, it was a wake-up call. Not long after, Nathan told me he wanted to change his priorities and put God first and family second in his career after that. My resentment, that bitterness, was replaced with contentment and joy. There was healing taking place. This disease became a catalyst for meaningful change in our life and in our marriage and in our family. While lupus, not a good thing in and of itself, it became a tool that God used to bring about healing in areas of our life that at the time we didn't even recognize needed healing. So I really don't pray for healing, physical healing from lupus anymore, because God has given me joy in spite of the disease. But when you really think about it, I have been healed. We've been healed. Not only on the outside, but on the inside. God's changed our attitudes and the desires of our hearts. And now I can see that God is not just working in us, but he was working through us Um, because Nathan and I got to plant this church. We've been able to serve here at many capacities at Kara City and in our community. God's using us to make a difference for his kingdom. In the beginning, my prayer meant one thing, take the lupus away. But now I see that God's plan for healing me and subsequently my family is far better than anything I could have imagined. 
God may still heal me physically from lupus, but I don't know that he will. God never promised that life would be easy or that we would never suffer. In fact, Jesus says just the opposite. But he also says that he will never leave us and that he is greater than whatever we're going through. In John 16, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's a great comfort, especially when we're suffering. We don't know whether God will take away our illness and our pain in this life. We can't control that. But what we can control is how we respond. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's easy to be happy with God when things are good, when it feels like God's holding up his end of the bargain, but it's not nearly as easy to rejoice and praise God when we suffer. But it's in those moments that God may be the most pleased with us. When we rejoice, even if he doesn't heal the way we think he should, even when the chemo isn't making the cancer go, and go, go away or the doctors have run out, run out of options, we're giving God our very best. We're submitting to his will. We are not called to predict what God will do. We are called to stand firm in what he w- can do and then submit to him and let him be God. Paul also tells us to give thanks in all circumstances. That's hard. I know what you're thinking. I don't understand. Your situation is different from mine, but that's just the fear. Fear has crept in telling you that all is lost. Your situation is different. You can't see a light at the end of the tunnel. But if you can just find one thing to give thanks for each day, you'll actually begin to feel thankful. This is true. I practice this in my life. Every day, I try to find one thing to be thankful for. Maybe it's a kind word from someone. Maybe it's a joke on Facebook. Maybe um, it's a text from a friend who says, I was thinking about you or I prayed for your family today. It could be anything. You could even you could write it down. You could keep a journal. You could take a picture of it. You could Facebook it. Um, but the key is to give thanks for at least one thing every single day. Another way to keep a positive outlook during suffering is to serve others. The more you can focus your attention on someone else, the less you focus on your own suffering. It gives perspective. You see you aren't the only one with problems. When you help and serve other people, it provides healing to them as well well, and for you. It reminds you that you are not alone. And the last thing Paul tells us is to pray continually. In other words, never, ever stop. Hold on to hope in your prayers that God will heal you, whether it physically, mentally, spiritually, and know that one day, even if it's not here, we will be healed in eternity. Some of you already know this, but over the last 10 years, in addition to Lil's lupus, we've also fought with some very difficult health struggles with one of our kids. And this last year has been especially hard as we've had almost two months of hospital stays, a couple of different times she's been really sick, and one night time near death. We've had some ups and downs as we've finally gotten a diagnosis on this disease, but the fight's just started. Now we're battling it in what it is and trying to make it better. And I think your kids hurting and suffering is way worse than you hurting and suffering. I mean, watching your child, you just just so desperately want for God to take away that pain and that suffering because it's keeping her from living a normal life and it's causing her emotional and physical pain. I don't know about you, but 2024 has been the toughest period of my life. Not just because of that, but there just seems like a a whole lot has gone on this year. But I give thanks for what we've accomplished. I, I give thanks for her treatment and that we now have a diagnosis. I also thank God for the time that we've gotten to spend with her as our daughter. Maybe the most difficult part of a health struggle with your child is a recognition that your child really doesn't belong to you. They belong to God. And even though you love them desperately, your love can't even start to compare with the love that God has for your child. What ultimately happens isn't up to us. And so we have to let God be good. Look, I I don't get what God is doing in this circumstance. I don't. I don't fully understand his plan. But I know this. My God is good and his plan is perfect. And I can see some good that's already coming from that. I know that I have way more compassion and sympathy for other people who are going through some tough things because of this difficult experience I've been through. 
I think it's made me a better pastor and able to empathize and hurt with other people. Look, it's also made me a better dad because I've put a new focus on the time I have with her, whatever that looks like. More time and energy and passion just to make the most of every opportunity. As we've gone through this struggle, I've tried to live out the words of a worship song that we sing pretty regularly here at Karis City. I will praise you on the mountain, but I will also praise you when the mountain's in my way. That's what it looks like to submit to God's will. We praise him in the highs, but we also praise him in the lows. He is God and he is worthy of our praise no matter what's going on. I'm not telling you that the sickness of my wife and this fight, this health battle with one of my kids doesn't sometimes knock me down. It does. But when it does, I get back up and I praise God for who he is and what he's done. Heal me is a dangerous prayer when we're serious about it. When we pray in desperation and faith and submission to God's will, we're inviting God into our lives to transform us and use us for his glory and his purpose. So here's the takeaway question. Are you brave enough to pray this dangerous prayer? God, heal me. Let's pray.